Hi and welcome to the Sunday podcast from the team at GMC, Gillespie Memorial Church in Dunfermline, in Scotland. I'm Pastor Mike Weaver, the minister at GMC, and with our team, Reverend Maggie Lane, Reverend David Melville and Elder Ronnie Aitken, we are leading our church to be a people of God seeking to grow in God's word and so bless the city with the good news of Jesus Christ. Our sermon series, Living in the Light of Christ, Confidence and Encouragement in Christ, finds us in St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, a letter full of affection for a church Paul, along with Silvanus and Timothy, had planted. It is a letter full of advice for the life of the Christian and their faith in the world. How to evangelise and be a pastor, how to withstand suffering in life and understand the priorities for Jesus in your life, always with the return of Jesus in mind. Written to a church of new believers, it still speaks to those young in faith, but also has much to say to all believers today, whoever they are. So thanks for joining us and I pray this podcast will be a blessing to you as we seek the truths in God's word. But before that, we come to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we come this morning knowing that you are here. You created this world, you gave us life and you give us everything we need to live. All we can say is thank you. There is nothing else we can say. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for providing us with shelter and food, for for comforting us, protecting us, guiding us. You have given us your word, which is all we need. Thank you for your word, which provides your truth. We accept your word. Teach us how to take action, to stand firm on your promises, to be strong and to speak your truth to all. Thank you that we are your children and you love each of us despite our flaws and failings. So often we fail to do what you have asked us, asked of us. Sorry, We have been willful and disobedient. We are sorry for all we have done which goes against your truth. Only you can forgive us and bring us back to you. Father, we can so easily be swayed by the world around us. Forgive us when we act in ways which do not honour or glorify you. Show us where we have gone wrong and teach us how to be better. You sent your son to be an example for how we should live. You have provided us with every opportunity to be like Jesus, and yet we fail. Forgive us when we fall short of what you expect. Thank you for Jesus' example and for the sacrifice he made for us and for this world. His death and resurrection has given us life and freedom. All we can say is thank you. And we can strive to be more like Jesus in our daily lives, reaching out to those who need to hear the good news of your redeeming love. As we begin a new week, we have, we have your promise that you are always with us. Give us opportunities to demonstrate your unconditional love to all with whom we have contact and to reach out to those in need. Give us opportunities to witness to the changes you have made in our lives. Father God, as we prepare to hear the word you have given Mike for us this morning, open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to respond. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I hope through our prayers your heart is ready to receive deeply from God's word. Whatever life is thrown your way currently, whether life is going great or times are stormy, please know that the Word of God is powerful. God's Word is able to challenge, to transform and ultimately to change your life. So listen in to the reading and the exposition from our preacher. If the reading from the Bible and the message from our preacher raises any questions or doubts or maybe challenges you over the way you are living life today, or perhaps you just want to know more about the way of Christ and getting to know the Lord Jesus, then we'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch via our website or through the office. Details are in our show notes. If you'd like to support GMC financially and our ministry for the kingdom, then offering details can be found on the homepage of our website, gillespiechurch.org. Now, over to our preacher. God's Word today uh, continues in... uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, picking up, funnily enough, where we left last week, um, we're going to read from chapter 2, verse 13. 
No, that's wrong. I've got that written down wrong. <laughs> We're not. Are we going to... Is it? So, Do you know why? My brain's already on next week. I'm away for a retreat this coming week. And I've been working on next week's sermon. I'm thinking, no, that's not what I... I was working yesterday on ver- verse uh, 17 onwards. Yes. Correction. We're coming to the word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 to 16. Hear the word of God. You said it was going to be messy, Richard. It is. Hear the word. And we also thank God constantly for this. That when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God which is at work in you, believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches, churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word, for it is your word, it is holy, it is right and true. Father, speak into our hearts and our minds to the very depths of our souls with your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Like all God's word from Scripture, it's rich. This passage this morning, Paul pours out gratitude and encouragement to the Thessalonians. But before I get into the passage... I wanted to address, I don't know whether some of you picked it up there, a concern some have, sometimes around Paul's writings and maybe here too about it being anti-Semitic in its undertone. But I would say like many things, when taken out of context, words can be used to support any position that they were never intended to support. And such is the case. So briefly, before I get into the bulk of what I want to say this morning, uh, the question in the verse in question is verse 14, and it's towards the end of that verse. Uh, it says, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Jesus Christ that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they, they being the church in Christ uh, Jesus in Judea, as they did from the Jews. That Greek word for Jews, eudaios, can mean Jew, it can mean Jewish, it can refer to one from Judea. But in the context Paul writes it, it is more referring to Jewish leaders and others under their influence who were opposing the early church, opposing those who had Christian faith at the time. It was not a condemnation of all Jews because they were Jewish. And why do we know that? Well, first of all, Paul was a Jew. He was well-read. He knew his Torah. He knew his scriptures. He was knowledgeable. And he was writing in a time when Christianity was very early. And Christianity was not differentiated from Judaism as it is today. And so he was writing as both an insider and an outsider. As a Jewish man, he was a member of this minority group called Christians who were fighting for their distinctiveness and their continued existence, really. But he was not writing about all Jews, but rather was focusing on those who wouldn't acknowledge Jesus as God's Messiah and were actively opposing those who made such declarations. We know this is not anti-Semitic because you only have to go to Romans. I'm not going to read all of it because it's three chapters. If you go to Romans 9 through 11, chapters 9 through 11, you will get Paul's, a greater understanding of Paul's view on the Jews there. But just from the first verse of chapter 11, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. 
For I am myself an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So this is really just to lay out, there are no anti-Semitic tropes in the word of God. But it does help us to understand the complexity of relationship between Jews and Christians, between our faiths, enabling us to see a picture of God's word, how it was then received, opposed, and that is what is central to today's message. So I'm going to dive into that. Last week we saw Paul encouraging the Thessalonian believers to walk in a way that honoured God. First he talked about their faith, then he shared about his ministry among them, not just his but Silvanus and Timothy too. Today he's circling back to thankfulness and how the Thessalonian believers are experiencing challenge in their lives because of this faith that they have. And so I want to consider two things. I want to consider the word at work within the believers, the word at work within them, as well as the world at work against them. The word at work within them, the world at work against them. But before that, I better decide, uh, define what I mean by the word. Well, the word simply is the word of God. I suggested last week, and I've suggested many times, that the word of God for many is not sacred. It has no relevance to their lives. And for some that have stepped forward to Christian faith, it then becomes a text ripe for deconstruction, which I mentioned last week. And people believe so because they think it is a work of human hands. And so you can rightly critique it, you can textualize it, or, and then you can reapply it and give meaning in your life or just discard it because human reason and wisdom matter more. Some will ask, how can a, a text that has been passed down through generations be accurate? How could it be correctly transmitted? How can we receive it in the 21st century when it was written over a one and a half thousand year time period, the youngest part of which is near enough 2,000 years old? This is not a sermon to convince the skeptics, the over-enthusiastic opponents of Christianity of their position is wrong. But I want you, if you're here as a believer today, to understand the coherence of Scripture, the accurate transmission of Scripture through the centuries. And this is the important point. Know when you read it, when you hear it being read and faithfully preached, that you are hearing the very word of God. Has everyone played the game Chinese Whispers? Or elsewhere it's known as Broken Telephone, Grapevine, Pass the Message. You know the idea, you have a line of kids, sometimes adults, and you start, somebody at one end whispers a message, a sentence, and it gets passed down the line, and when you get to the final person at the end of the line, they say what they heard, and the person who started the message say what they heard. And most of the time, things are lost in transmission. What started doesn't arrive. But if, if it wasn't so much Chinese whispers, because things get lost in a whisper, if it got transmitted faithfully, and each person down the line listened carefully, the person who spoke, spoke clearly, and when you got to the final person and they repeated the sentence, and the person who started said, that's exactly what I said. Do you know what the person at the end has heard? They haven't heard the message from the person next to them or the person next to them. They've heard the message from the originator. It might have been transmitted by, by 5, 10, 20 people, but they've heard the original word as it came. And that is what Paul is saying about the scriptures contained in the Bible. It's what I conclude when I investigate and read my Bible. The Bible that you have in your hands, that are on your bookshelves at home, are the inerrant word of God. And so the word faithfully read and transmitted today, preached today, 
down the ages, nothing is lost in translation. So when Paul writes here to the Thessalonians, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. It is the word of God. They've received Paul's preaching correctly, yes, from a man, but it is the word of God they've heard. And there are three steps in them engaging in the word. They receive the word, they accept the word, and then they believe the word. So the first thing is to receive the word of God. And what do I mean by receiving something? Mr. Amazon's coming to deliver to me and he rings the doorbell. I open the door, I receive, I take. It means I'm being open. I'm being open. This way. You don't feel well. Head out. That way. So yeah, you, it's like receiving the word of God is, if you've got somebody you trust, really trust, your spouse, a parent, a friend, a family member, someone you really trust, and they share deeply with you wisdom, knowledge, then you are open to them. You open the door, the heart, your heart to them as you listen, and you receive their shared words. Think of this from 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul writes, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. In other words, Paul was authoritative in his preaching of the gospel. The Corinthians hear directly from him, but it comes from God, and they understand it to be God's gospel message, which they received and stood firmly in it. And what is the gospel message? What is the message? The Bible is vast, but what's the message? In Acts 10, 42, 43, Paul was commanded to, as it says, to preach to the people and to testify, namely that he, he being Jesus, is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Simply the gospel. And that's what Paul faithfully is preaching. It comes with responsibility. It's an awesome responsibility to handle the word of God correctly, to convey it correctly. It means that one must read and prepare well, and whether that's for a Sunday morning in preaching, whether it's to lead a life group, whether it's to lead biblical prayers, <coughs> in any area people transmit the truth, God's word is paramount. But it's not just for the person who's transmitting it. It's for the receiver too, the person who's listening, you, you this morning. For you, there should be a sense of awe in the scriptures as they are faithfully unpacked. There should be a sense that God speaks. You shouldn't really leave a Sunday morning or a life group or a Sunday evening service or a midweek Bible study unchanged. When you come in, you shouldn't be going out a different person in some way. We should not be coming under the word of God in a blasé way. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So God's word is to be received. And then comes the next part. It needs to be accepted. It's one thing taking the package off the Amazon driver. If I then just take it and dump it in the bin, I might have received it, but I haven't accepted it, have I? I've got to open it. Accepting the word of God means welcoming it into your life, opening it. 
It's like welcoming an honored guest into your home rather than just a casual acquaintance, somebody you honor. It's about letting God's word settle deep in your heart, allowing it to transform you. Jesus spoke about this in the parable of the sower. He explained it. He explained it in Luke 8. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. They've heard it, they've received it, but they didn't get to accept it. And so they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. For they believe for a while and in a time of testing fall away. They've opened their package from Amazon and they've looked at it and then put it on the shelf and forgot about it. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life and their fruit does not mature. And as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Accepting is bringing it to your heart. It's holding on fast to it with a good heart. So we read it and receive it or hear it and receive it and then we accept it and then third, believe. Believe the word of God. To really believe is to trust. To trust that the word, as the Thessalonians had done, believed Paul that had preached was from God, not just from man. And so too, we must. We must trust the Bible we read today, passed down through time, that it is the same powerful word of God, alive and relevant for us, effective in us, as it was for the Thessalonians and the Corinthians and the Romans and the Philippians and the Colossians, and the Galatians, and all people through all times who've received the word of God. Because it does not land lightly. When we hear it with an open heart, with trust and faith, it doesn't land lightly, it changes lives. Why? Because it brings us face to face with the author, God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Word of God brings us face to face. And it's not that we should be worshipping the Bible. Not in the sense that you venerate a book and a text and you bow down before it. It's not the book itself we venerate. But we are to worship the one it reveals the Word of God is the revelation of the fullness of God. And within our ability to understand, within our wisdom and within our minds, by the Word, the Holy Spirit illuminates who God is in order that we believe. And so what is the result of this receiving, accepting and believing in the Word of God? Well, Paul goes on and says that it works in you. Paul acknowledged that the Thessalonians had accepted the word of God and that it was working the believers. And how did he know it was at work? He's already told us in chapter 1 that they, they were laboring in love, they were steadfast in hope in the Lord Jesus in face of opposition. These are both evidences of the gospel at work. He could have said the Holy Spirit was at work in them. He doesn't. He says the Word of God is at work in them. The Word of God is at work through the Holy Spirit in them. The Word of God. In chapter 1, verse 6, Paul said, You became imitators of us and of the Lord. And then here he says, They are imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. They are starting to imitate. They are becoming like. But they're not copying human works, human traditions. 
but rather they are following the churches in Judea who were committed to the way of Jesus. They're not following their human ways because it's not safe to follow human traditions and ways, but rather to imitate God's ways and his word. So Paul is saying they are imitating brothers and sisters who are mature in the faith, And the evidence of this is God at work. There's also another proof of God at work, and that's suffering. It's not popular. None of us want to suffer. But the fact that they are suffering and enduring is evidence that they are suffering for the word. Because truly, do you believe that if it was only the word of man, if this was Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy just espousing human wisdom would people put up with the persecution they put up with would a man or woman facing martyrdom death die for some human wisdom or would they go actually no do you know i'll give it up but where you've had christians around the world who've had a sword at their neck a gun at their head will you renounce jesus and they say no and they die for it They wouldn't do that for a man or a woman's words, but for God's they would. Paul compares the Thessalonian believers suffering to the same thing suffered by Christ. He said they were following the churches in Judea. They were suffering just as Paul had suffered, but ultimately they were suffering just as Jesus had, and he died at the hands of his persecutors. He goes a little bit further than that. He goes on to say and connect the rejection of Jesus, God's Messiah, by his fellow Jews with much earlier rejection of the prophets. I'm not going to, that's a rabbit hole I could go down to, but we'll be here all day. But if you think of people like Elijah and Daniel and Jeremiah, the persecution they faced for speaking God's word. So what we see happening to these Thessalonian believers is two things simultaneously. As I said at the beginning, there is evidence of the word of God at work in them and there's evidence of the world at work against them. And that is the shift of the believer from the world to the word. When we're born again, we join Christ's family, becoming part of his church. As the Holy Spirit then works in us, in the life of new believers, there's that thing called ongoing sanctification, where we are becoming more Christ-like. And when we become more Christ-like, we start to align and look like the family of God. And so it's no wonder those outside of the church don't necessarily like the things they see of new believers because they no longer look like them. That's why outsiders, we're different. So they don't like or agree with what they see. Why? Why does this happen? Well, it happened to the one we follow. Jesus himself said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's in John 15. So the Christian, we can expect opposition and suffering. But there's something else too on the opposite side of that. For those who oppose Christ and his church, they are displeasing to God. And being displeasing to God comes with consequences. Paul, towards the end of our passage, speaks of these people opposing all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Paul has been chased out of Thessalonica and Philippi. He's being opposed for proclaiming the word of God to the Gentiles. 
all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. In other words, the people opposing Paul are filling up the measure. They are racking up their sins against God. They are not receiving and accepting God's word, and more than that, they're attempting to stop others receiving it too. I'd argue that's where we are today. In much of the world, as speech, free speech, is becoming harder. So in its infancy, maybe, what we can and cannot say, where and when we can say things. But God's plan is salvation. And his salvation plan, Ephesians 1.10, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Under Christ. Those who oppose the sharing of the gospel and bringing others to the knowledge of the word of God not only oppose the believer, they oppose God himself. And as I said, that comes with consequences. God will save those he calls. Opponents of Christianity cannot stop this. But their actions add to their sins and make plain their opposition to God, and they will know the reality of God's word. And the closing sentence of today's reading says, but wrath has come upon them at last. That at the end, at Christ's second coming, there will be a clear dividing line. And wrath will come. I mean, Paul was writing this letter to the Thessalonians in the early 50s AD. It could be argued that the wrath of God came up on the opponents of Jesus Christ in 70 AD when the Roman legion sacked Jerusalem and the temple was torn down. But as Paul writes here, the wrath of God has come up on them at last. That could all be so be translated as, as come up on them fully. That means there will be certain judgment of opposers of the word of God. This passage is, is kind of an interlude. It's a, not an outlier, but it's a, it's a link. And Paul will go on to continue to speak about his ongoing relation with, relationship with the believers in Thessalonica. In a passage where he has highlighted this normal Christian experience, he's taken a step back from, from other things he will get on to. He will go on back into to prayer as he started off, thanks and uh, praise and prayer. But here, he is just saying to them, that coming to Christ, you will receive the word of God. You will accept it, you will believe the word of God, and in those stages, it will work in you. You will change. And you should not be surprised that for all believers, that will include some opposition. It may not be drastic opposition where you have to choose your life or death on your faith. But it could be ridicule from a family member. It could be difficulty in life at work. But no, the opposition to those with faith will come. And more so, it will be directed at those who faithfully preach and teach God's word. Because opposers of God's word do not want it being proclaimed. And new people coming to faith. But no matter what the challenges or persecutions we face, that is not the end of the story. It, in our world, it might seem like things are out of control. And some say, God might exist, but he's not really in control here. It's chaos. No. Salvation is assured, but also is God's wrath, the tough stuff. And both are there to remind us that justice is coming. And in justice, there is right and wrong. And that is an encouragement to stray strong in our faith. And may we all today be such a people encouraged by his word. His word. May we receive it, accept it, believe it, know it, and may it be working in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for 
the faithful transmission of your word down the ages. We thank you for the faithful translation into languages we can read and understand. We thank you that you move through the power of your word, the Logos, the word who became flesh, Jesus Christ. We thank you the word reveals to us both the magnificence and understanding of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but also the mystery. And Father, we can rest in mystery. Not know all, but be thankful in knowing that by receiving and accepting and believing in the Lord Jesus, we are saved. I pray for protection on us this day for your church against all that will come against it. And that each one here through Messy Church and in churches all across this land that we will serve you faithfully to the end of our days. And all God's people said, Amen. Thanks for listening to the Sunday podcast from our team. If you'd like more details about GMC and who we are, what we believe and how we serve, then visit our website at gillespiechurch.org. Find us on Facebook or look back at some of the videos on our YouTube channel. Just search Gillespie Memorial Church. All inquiries can be made through the Contact Us page on our website. Again, details are in the show notes. If you'd like to support our work with a financial donation, then offerings can be made by clicking the Support Us with Stewardship icon through the homepage of our website. If you liked what you heard, then please follow our podcast page, like it and share it with friends and family. This has been a production of GMC, including the pastors and the tech team, or copyright remains with the producers. Today's episode was edited by Jack Wiggle, and the soundtrack is Blessed Assurance by the team at City of Light, performed by Gordon Eastop and Mike Weaver. Thanks for listening, and God bless.